Welcome to The Drive Podcast. I'm your host, Peter Atia. If you like this video, please let me know by subscribing to the channel or visiting my website to become a member for more exclusive content. You know, the most obvious reason is that the brain is the organ that generates behavior. And so if you think that behavior of any kind relates to body fatness, what we eat, how much we eat, how we use your body, how we use our bodies, how we sleep, whether we're stressed or not. If we think any of that relates to body fatness, then we think the, the brain is, is playing a role. I think most people would agree that food intake, quantity and quality is, is pretty important there. Um, and then the second reason is that the brain actually contains a regulatory system for body fat, for body fatness, I should say, body fat mass. And it's the only known system in the body that does that. And it's located primarily in a part of the brain called the hypothalamus, which is like, a, I forget who described it this way. It's, maybe it was Herman Ponser. It's like a lot of bubble gum on the bottom of your brain near where your optic nerves cross. So it's this little tiny part of the brain that specializes in homeostasis, maintaining the stability of body systems. I was described it as a walnut, but maybe- A walnut, bit. okay, yeah. 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 So just to give you an example, it, it's the part of the brain that regulates body temperature. And there's a thermostat in there, and effectively a thermostat and thermometers. There are thermometers that measure your core temperature. There are thermometers on your skin that measure future threats to your core temperature. Like if you jump into a cold lake, your core temperature doesn't instantly drop, but your brain knows that it will drop because of the temperature sensors in your skin. And so it can respond adaptively. And then that system in the hypothalamus engages a behavioral, a, a suite of behavioral and physiological responses to maintain temperature homeostasis. So you'll, on the physiology side, you get vasoconstriction, you get um, non-shivering thermogenesis through brown fat, you get shivering. And then through the behavioral side, you want to get out of the cold water, you want to put a sweater on, you want to, you know, drink some hot tea, uh, you want to adopt a heat conserving posture. And through this coordinated physiology and behavior, you get incredible regulation of temperature, of core temperature, I should say. And, uh, you know, like plus or minus one degree Fahrenheit when the exterior temperature could be varying by 50 degrees. And so it's, it's an incredible regulatory system. And the body fat regulatory system, unfortunately, is not so precise. Um, but I, I give that as an analogy just to give you a sense of what the hypothalamus specializes in. There's also a regulatory system for body fatness. And a nice name for that is the lipostat. So lipo, fat, stat, the same. And really, we've known about it since... 1840 or we've known there was something going on since 1840 when the Viennese physician Bernard Moore published a case study about a woman who had extreme obesity that rapid onset extreme obesity he did an autopsy after her death and she had a tumor in her hypothalamus and to this day hypothalamic obesity is a thing that we have to deal with with people with tumors or other damage to the hypothalamus it often causes extreme obesity and what's the nature of the obesity? How much of it is due to um, hyperphagia, uh, excess eating? How much of it is due to loss of uh, activity or even just a shutdown of metabolic rate? Yeah, that's a great question. So if you look at probably the closest experimental analog of uh, hypothalamic obesity that uh, sort of human-like hypothalamic obesity would be um, VMH lesion. So this is something that's been done since I think the 20s. They go in with a very precise instrument called a stereotaxic instrument in animals and they lesion this part of the hypothalamus called the ventromedial hypothalamus. So basically they're, they're replicating, they're trying to replicate the damage of hypothalamic obesity. And as soon as the anesthesia wears off, these animals are cramming food into their faces. And if there's no food in their cage, they'll eat bedding, they'll eat the bedding, they will just like put anything 
they can get a hold of into their bodies. And they will continue binging until they have rapidly gained a large amount of weight, and then it will start to plateau off. Um, but they have extreme hyperphagia. And if you restrict their calorie, the first experiments that were done on this showed that if you restrict them to a normal level of calorie intake, so that of a non lesioned animal, it prevents the fat gain, suggesting that the, or I should rephrase that, it prevents the weight gain. So they were just weighing them at the time, suggesting that it's primarily a phenotype of hyperphagia. However, later experiments. Uh, that were more precise found that it, it doesn't completely eliminate the weight gain. It only eliminates about 80% of it. And so there is a component from energy coming from energy expenditure. So uh, primarily hyperphagia, but there's also an energy expenditure component that's smaller.